This is Twit. Last Friday, tw- uh, on the 22nd, the security firm um, Veloxity published the details of a somewhat astonishing and successful attack. Being several years old, predating Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this story is not about a threat any of us will ever face, at least almost certainly not. But I wanted to share it since it presents a perfect example of my porosity theory of security, where the security of today's systems is best viewed as being porous to varying degrees. I I like this model of a porous system, which I think fits best, because while the amount of effort an attacker may need to exert to obtain access to any specific system may vary, most systems can, or or yeah and 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 look at systems in the broadest sense most systems can ultimately be breached by a sufficiently motivated and determined attacker okay now that might mean you know arranging to install a subverted employee into the organization you know right right playing the long game or it might mean you know subjecting employees to phishing attacks of increasing complexity until you finally make it happen the the the, the point is our systems are not infinitely secure they're you know kind of secure where it kind of varies so the you know, the the, the, the term absolute security is more of a concept than a reality today. OK, so here's how Volexity opened their disclosure of this astonishing attack, which they're now able to talk about. They wrote in early February of 2022, notably just ahead of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that ends up being significant, as we'll see. Volexity made a discovery that led to one of the most fascinating and complex incident investigations we'd ever worked. The investigation began when an alert from a customer detection signature Velexity had deployed at a customer site. And and they said, we'll refer to them as Organization A, because they're still going to be anonymous even today, indicated a threat actor had compromised a server on that customer's network. They said, while Velexity quickly investigated the threat activity, more questions were raised than answers due to a very motivated and skilled advanced persistent threat, you know, APT actor, who was using a novel attack vector Velexity had not previously encountered. At the end of the investigation, Velexity would tie the breach To a Russian threat actor, it tracks as Gruesome Larch, publicly known as, and by many names, one is best known, I I like, APT-28. There's also Forest Blizzard, Sophocy, Fancy Bear, and among other names. In other words, the Russians. They said Velexity further determined that Gruesome Larch was actively targeting Organization A in order to collect data from individuals with expertise on and projects actively involving Ukraine. Okay, so what did Velexity's investigation uncover? Strange as it might at first seem, despite being thousands of miles away in Russia, this this well-known APT-28 group of Russian state-sponsored actors breached an unnamed U.S. company, this organization A, by gaining access through its enterprise Wi-Fi network. But wait, we're thousands of miles away in Russia. How's that possible? If I told you that the attack had been dubbed the nearest neighbor attack, you'd start to get the idea. That's right. APT-28 pivoted to their ultimate target after first compromising an organization in a nearby building that was in Wi-Fi range of their target. APT-28 has this level of expertise. They're part of Russia's military unit 26165 in the General Staff Main Intelligence Directorate, the GRU, and they're known 
to have been conducting offensive cyber operations dating as far back as 2004, so for the past 20 years. APT-28 initially obtained the credentials to the target's enterprise Wi-Fi network through password spraying attacks targeting a victim's public-facing service. But the presence of multi-factor authentication prevented the use of those credentials over the public web, so they couldn't use the web. Although connecting through the enterprise Wi-Fi did not require multi-factor authentication, as Velexity phrased it, quote, being thousands of miles away and an ocean apart from the victim presented a problem. So the hackers got creative and started looking at organizations in buildings nearby that could serve as a pivot to the target wireless network. The idea was to compromise another organization and search its network for a wired accessible device containing of a, a wireless adapter, you know, so a dual homed, both wired and wireless. Such a device, whether it be a laptop, a router, or an access point, would theoretically allow the hackers to use its wireless adapter to connect to the targets, the you know, organization A, the targeted organization's enterprise Wi-Fi. Felixity wrote this. They said, Felixity now determined the attacker was connecting to the network via wireless credentials they had brute forced from an internet-facing service. However, it was not clear where the attacker was physically that allowed them to connect to the enterprise Wi-Fi to begin with. Further analysis of data available from Organization A's wireless controller showed which specific wireless access points the attacker was connecting to. After overlaying them on a map, a physical map, that had a layout of the building and specific floors, Velexity could see the attacker was connecting to the same three wireless access points that were in a conference room at the far end of the building near windows along the street. This gave Velexity the first evidence that, as they put it, quote, the call was not coming from inside the building, unquote. Could this be an attacker conducting a close access operation from the street outside? Nothing was ruled out, but Velexity was not too far off from discovering, discovering the real answer. Okay, so what they discovered was that APT-28 had compromised multiple organizations as part of this attack. They daisy-chained their connection using valid access credentials. Ultimately, they gained access to a device con uh, containing a Wi-Fi radio that was able to connect to those three access points near the, the, the windows of the victim's conference room. Then using a remote desktop connection, you know, RDP, from an unprivileged account, the threat actor was able to move laterally within the target network to search for systems of interest and to exfiltrate the data, which had been their target all along. The attackers generally used living off the land techniques, as they're now referred to, which rely on mostly on already present native Windows tools in order to minimize their footprint and thus reduce the chance of being detected. And one of the things that hap that's happened in Windows through the years is the the number of of already present built-in utilities, you know, things you just don't even realize are there have really expanded. So for, for, for attackers who have a full, have full knowledge of just how much available utility is in windows for them to repurpose, um, there's a lot they're able to use. Even with all their research, Velexity was working from forensic data and was unable to trace the attacks back to the, the original attackers. Attribution at that point was still impossible. But a Microsoft report just this last April provided them with the missing clues. 
Velexity saw a clear overlap in indicators of compromise, as we call them, IOCs, that clearly matched and pointed to the Russian Advanced Persistent Threat Group. Based on details in Microsoft's report, it's very likely that APT28 was able to escalate privileges before running critical payloads by exploiting a zero-day vulnerability back in 2022, CVE 2022-38028, that existed in the Windows Print Spooler service, remember we, we talked about that a lot a couple of years ago, within the victim's network. So our unsettling takeaway from this is that close access operations, as they're known, that typically require proximity to the target, such as from an adjacent parking lot, sometimes is used, can also be conducted from great distances by compromising something nearby. You know, that makes an otherwise attack, an otherwise impossible attack possible um, and has the benefit of eliminating all the risk to the attacker of being physically identified and caught on site. Nobody can get them. The other and this is the most significant takeaway, I think, for our listeners is that everything should be logged. The mantra should be log everything. It's crucial to appreciate that it is inherently impossible to know which logs will be needed after the fact. And nothing brings an investigation to a grinding halt more quickly than running up against the, oh, we don't have logs of that. Today's storage is so inexpensive that it's no longer a factor. Logs don't take up much space. They contain so much redundant information and formatting, which is repetitive, that they compress down to nothing. And they serve as a form of time machine that later allow forensics investigators to venture far back into the past to view what happened when and to retrace the previously unseen footsteps of unknown network users. And logs are not only useful for tracking Russians. Large corporations cannot be certain about the changing motivations and loyalties of their own employees. So an IT culture of logging and letting it be widely known within the enterprise that everything within an organization is being logged is a bit like planting a sign on the front lawn to let would-be burglars know that the premises is being monitored by such and such a company. It can be an ounce of prevention. It reminds me of the warning that I always get when I do an SU do and mistype the administrator password. And then it says, or give the wrong name. It says, you are not allowed to do this. Your presence will be logged. <laughs> <laughs> They back in the day, they yep. knew this stuff. You know, the other lesson though is also important, which is that we are not operating on our own, that we are in a community and our security impacts other people's security, right? That yeah. this is this is not just our machine that we're securing or not securing. We could be a vulnerability happening to our neighbor. Yeah. Well, and in fact, you know. Oftentimes now, you, you you go and look at the available Wi-Fi access points within range. Oh, man. It's, it's <laughs> astonishing. It is, really, yes. <laughs> you, we're, we're living in a community, and uh, yeah. we all have a responsibility yeah. to protect so each other. It is, well. it is the case that one Wi-Fi network is able to see another one, and if the hackers are good, they can get near you and then use that Wi-Fi link to jump across the air gap. So, wow, <laughs> the world we live in today. Hey, it's Leo Laporte. I hope you've enjoyed this little snippet from Security Now. If you want the whole show, you can get it at our website, twit.tv slash SN. Of course, you can subscribe to Security Now on your favorite podcast or just click one of the links below. Security now.